money is a pretty hollow substitute for death or life-altering injuries. And the idea that you would provide a mother and father who lost a son at the World Trade Center, you provide them, you know, three million dollars and expect thank you, justice? No, it, it, it's mercy, but it's not justice. That's Ken Feinberg, special master to the 9-11 Victims' Compensation Fund and the inspiration behind the film Worth, starring Michael Keaton. You have to exhibit empathy, but you have to exhibit empathy in other ways than mouthing cliché or something like that. I'm Michael Mogul, founder and CEO of Crisp, the nation's number one law firm growth company. I've built my business through practice, not theory. Crisp started with just $500 to my name and has grown to over eight figures in revenue over the last few years, earning a spot on the Inc. 500 list of the fastest growing private companies in America. Our approach has been to take everything we've learned about generating massive growth within our own organization and help the country's most ambitious and committed law firm owners do the same for theirs. In each episode of this podcast, I sit down with innovative market leaders from the legal industry and beyond to learn from those who thrive in the face of adversity, challenge the status quo, and define what it means to be a true game changer. I sat down with Ken Feinberg to discuss the subjective process of placing a monetary value on a human life, why individuals have more power than they may think, and the lessons learned from his unprecedented effort to compensate the victims of 9-11. Most of the mistakes that we made were mistakes of empathy. That's coming up on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. Ken Feinberg is one of the most accomplished mediation and dispute resolution attorneys in the country. In addition to being appointed special master to the U.S. government's 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund, he's helped to administer the response to some of the most complex crises in human history, including Agent Orange, the BP Deepwater Horizon Gulf oil spill, and the Boston Marathon bombings. I began our conversation by asking Ken what motivated him to become a lawyer. I uh, originally thought that I would become an actor. I, in high school and college, was uh, on the stage quite a bit. And I thought that um, my future would probably take me to Broadway or Hollywood or something. My father gave me some very good advice. He said, you know, Ken, most actors are waiting on tables in restaurants in New York City and Los Angeles. Why don't you go to law school instead and take your acting skills and uh, become a lawyer in the courtroom? And that was very, very sound advice from my father. And did you ever see yourself as a mediator or even like specializing in mediation? Not at all. When I went to law school in ancient times at NYU in New York City, there was no course in mediation or alternative dispute resolution or anything like that. And um, I became a mediator and a claims neutral purely by accident when a judge that I knew, Judge Jack Weinstein in Brooklyn, federal court, uh, asked me to mediate the Agent Orange Vietnam Veterans Herbicide uh, litigation. And that set me on my uh, on on a different professional course. And, and as we have get more up to speed currently, so now I mean, you're you've helped administer some of the most complex probably public crises in American history, like Agent Orange, as you mentioned, the BP Deepwater Horizon, the Boston Marathon, and then you know, of course the 9/11 Victims Compensation Fund. Um, as you know, as I was reading through all of this and even watching the movie, reading the book, the thought that kept going through my mind was, why subject yourself to this in the first place, to all of this? Well. When I was growing up in Massachusetts, President Kennedy said that uh, every individual can make a difference. And I think my sense of uh, patriotism, my desire to give back to this great country, to um, try and help those innocent victims of tragedy, all of that came together and convinced me that uh, this was a, a noble undertaking and uh, somebody should do it. And if you're asked by a president of the United States, George Bush in 9-11, Barack Obama in BP, you can't say that you're too busy or you're, um, you're traveling or anything like that. You have to step up to the plate and try and help. So I think that's why. 
I'm sure there's been some dramatizing in, in the movie, but you know, in the movie when you received the call from from President Bush, was did it have the same brevity that it did in the movie? Actually, this is a good example of dramatic license in the movie. I did not speak with President Bush at the front end of the program. I spoke frequently with Attorney General John Ashcroft, uh, one of my heroes of the 9-11 fund. But I I met with President Bush after the 9-11 fund effort was over. He invited me to the Oval Office with my colleague Camille Barros. We had a nice chat, and he expressed the thanks of a grateful nation for the 9-11 fund work, and it was a, a great experience. And of, of all the different cases you've taken on pro bono, like the Aurora case, the, the Boston Marathon, the, the 9-11 Victims Compensation Fund, which one was the most challenging? The 9-11, 9-11. Because you see, the 9-11 fund was unique. There was no precedent for this. Public taxpayer money being used to compensate a certain segment of American citizens and, and American individuals. World Trade Center, the airplanes, the Pentagon. There had never been anything like this. And the emotional impact of meeting with hundreds and hundreds of families in private or surviving victims was debilitating, absolutely emotionally debilitating. And that is why, for me at least, in enlisting all of the various programs of um, undertaken. 9-11 stands at the top in terms of the challenges and of the uh, adverse impact on your psyche. And, you know, you took this one on pro bono. Why? Oh, I didn't think in this time of national emergency, this unprecedented tragedy, the idea that I'd be getting paid for compensating innocent victims of a unprecedented historical tragedy, I thought inappropriate and would lead to a great deal of criticism. And I just concluded at the outset that this was a um, an undertaking that I would assume on behalf of the American people and wouldn't seek any compensation for this for 33 months. And, and if I may ask, it'd be just with, you know, with the resources that you were investing into this just over the, almost that three year span um, and being able to continue to support everybody at the firm, how did you do it? Were there other cases that were ongoing that were allowed for you to be able to focus on this? Oh, absolutely. Excellent question. I had uh, the rest of my law firm, another three or four lawyers who were diligently doing other work, payable work, so that I could afford personal sacrifice, but I could afford to devote all of my time for 33 months to the 9-11 fund without compensation or reimbursement of any type, uh, while the firm continued to function on a reduced basis, but still we managed to you know, pay the bills. And I know you've written now multiple books on this topic, but it, one of the, the main themes throughout the movie is just what is a fair amount for a body, right? Like, how do you even begin to calculate that? Well, the trial lawyers who are listening, they know exactly. And the statute creating the 9-11 fund made it pretty clear. Look to state tort law. And the formula has been time honored for hundreds of years. What would the victim have earned over a work life but for the tragedy? Add something for pain and suffering, emotional distress, equals value. Now, that's a rather cold and calculating formula. And I had discretion and used my discretion frequently to modify it. But the basic outline of state tort law around this nation is exactly that. That's why the Wall Street stockbroker or banker who's um, in an automobile accident will receive more from the jury than a waiter or a busboy or a cop or a fireman or a soldier. They earn more, they get more. They earn less, they get less. That's the American legal system. 
What, what what are your thoughts on that though? Do you believe that all lives are equal? And I mean, I know this was different when you did the uh, the Boston bombing that that compensation fund. Well, but you're making a very important distinction. If you're going to set up a fund like the 9/11 fund, or the BP oil spill fund, or the General Motors ignition switch compensation fund, where any claimant receiving funds must sign a release, I will not sue. That's very, very different than the One Fund Boston Marathon Fund or the Pulse Nightclub Fund in Orlando, Florida, where it's a gift. There is no release. There is no trade-off. You can do both. And I do appreciate that when you're compensating not hundreds, but but thousands of people arising out of 9-11 or the BP oil spill, you are going to get a lot of pushback. Mr. Feinberg, you're giving $3 million. You gave my next-door neighbor $4 million. What do you have against my dead wife? You never even met her. You see, funds like the 9-11 fund promote the type of divisiveness you're trying to ameliorate, you're trying to avoid, but it's inevitable if everybody's going to receive a separate amount of money in 9-11. Not so the Boston Marathon. All lives are equal. There's no release. And I'm, I'm curious, this might be a, a, a stupid question, but when, when working with the fund, like let's say the 9-11 fund, is there a maximum limit you were working with, of meaning that of keeping the total fund compensation under, or how much of this was at your discretion? My discretion. You see, Congress, in its wisdom in creating the 9-11 fund, or BP, there's no limit. There's no isolated aggregate amount of money. Ken, use your discretion, whatever it'll take, whatever's necessary. Now, that is extremely helpful because it avoids situations where emotional and uh, very angry individuals would otherwise say, you're giving me less because you got to save some of the aggregate for my next door neighbor. In 9-11, Congress authorized whatever I need to be paid out of petty cash from the U.S. Treasury. There was no allocated, appropriated amount that made my job somewhat easier. Now, was this true? I mean, did you find different perspectives, perhaps, of gratitude, depending upon the financial livelihood of the, of the claimants? Gratitude? Not a word I would use. I try and avoid in all of these programs gratitude, appreciation, thanks. You don't expect that. Money is a pretty hollow substitute for death or life-altering injuries. And the idea that you would provide a mother and father who lost a son at the World Trade Center, you provide them, you know, $3 million and expect thank you, justice? No, it's mercy, but it's not justice. I recall, you know, hearing one interview that at one point, and I believe you re- you regretted this or used this as a lesson when you were speaking to one of the claimants and you said that you you understood how he felt, right? That was a terrible mistake. And, you know, every time I do one of these programs, you try and avoid mistakes, but it's inevitable. It's a very vulnerable group of people you're dealing with. And I said to one 82-year-old man who lost a son at the Pentagon, on 9-11, and he was crying about his lost son, and I said, Mr. Jones, this is terrible. I know how you feel. And he stopped, and he put his hand on my shoulder, patted it. He said, Mr. Feinberg, you've got a very difficult deal here. You've got a very difficult program. It's a very difficult assignment. I don't envy what you have to do. Don't ever tell someone like me you know how I feel. You have no idea how I feel, and it sounds hollow and pretentious. I'll never do that again. You have to exhibit empathy, but you have to exhibit empathy in other ways than mouthing cliche or something like that. Sometimes it's only through experiencing life's worst that we're confronted with how short life can truly be. In his experience administrating settlements to victims and their families, Ken learned that everyone grieves differently and responds differently. 
you try and explain to the person, Mrs. Jones, I agree. No amount of money will bring back your daughter. No amount. But Mrs. Jones, remember that at least as you move forward in life as best you can, take advantage of the financial certainty that this taxpayer-funded program provides you. It's not an answer to the hollow, hollowness of your existence now with your daughter gone. But don't compound the felony by ignoring the opportunity to at least have some financial certainty in a life now filled with uncertainty. And that, that type of a message eventually got through to all but two people. Only two people refused to take the 9-11 fund money and refused to litigate. They just were paralyzed by grief and they didn't neither. And, and Ken, looking back just through all of your experiences, I know we've talked about some of the mistakes. Are there, are there any others that you feel that you've made or perhaps that you've learned from? You, you make mistakes all the time. Most of the mistakes that we made were mistakes of empathy, were mistakes of emotion. One thing about the movie that is accurate, much of it is accurate, but one point in the movie and the book based on the movie that I emphasize is um, the mistakes you make in dealing with claimant, family, victim, emotion. It's not the calculations. The calculations are, are not rocket science. Thousands of lawyers every day make these calculations. It's the emotion and how you confront the anger and life's frustrations exhibited by the families and the victims that is where you better brace yourself for the real challenges. And, and I've read that you, you you mentioned you underestimated the amount of emotion at the beginning, didn't anticipate how much anger would be directed your way. And that you, you talk about this evolution that you had over this almost three-year period of, of going from a by-the-books attorney to a, a rabbi, a priest, and a nun, if you could speak to that evolution. Um, yeah. At the beginning of the 9-11 fund, you, you approach it as you would an airplane accident, a flood, earthquake. I underestimated somewhat the fact that the fund was created by Congress just weeks after the attacks. There was no time to deliberate or allow passions to cool. This was raw in your face. And it took me a while to appreciate that anger and that emotional reaching out, flailing away. I was the, the sole representative of the United States government in, in this fund. And the fingers and you know were pointed at me. How could the US government allow this to happen? I lost my wife. How could the government be asleep at the switch? And no matter how much I tried to explain, that wasn't on my watch. It took a while for people to realize that I really was there as a neutral third party trying to help people move on financially. Eventually, I won the day. And the movie points this out and the book points this out. Eventually, all but a few rallied around the fund and we distributed over seven billion dollars of taxpayer money in that 33 month period were you pleased with the outcome yes i was pleased congress wanted to minimize the number of lawsuits against the airlines and the world trade center congress wanted to exhibit to the world the generosity and compassion of the american people and if statistics are any indication, 97% voluntary agreement to come into the fund. And I believe Congress felt that the uh, fund was a, was a stunning success. Just don't do it again, but it was a stunning success. And, and for those listening that may not be as familiar with this, what would have happened had the, there not been this consensus, at least 80%? How, what, how bad could things have gone? Families would have hired retained lawyers. Lawyers would have brought lawsuits against 
the airlines, the World Trade Center, Massport, the Port Authority of New York, the private security guard companies, the airline manufacturers, and it would have been uh, a real mass tort Donnybrook that could have very adverse impact on the nation's economy and on the public relations of, of the United States. And I think Congress had that in mind when it created this alternative option. No lawsuits. Go into this fund voluntarily, listen to what Feinberg has to say, collect your money, sign a release, done, move on as best you can. And that's what uh, what worked. Did this weigh on you just, just throughout this period of thinking, I've, I've got to make sure that there's some resolution here? It's weighed on me for 20 years. It never stops weighing on you. It's debilitating. You never escape completely the stories you heard. The most debilitating part of the 9-11 fund was not the calculation of damages or the cutting of checks. Or, it was the emotional horror of personally conducting over, what, 900 private hearings with family members or survivors. And the stories that you hear resonate 20 years later as being beyond amazing. That never leaves you. And, and I'm curious, I mean, obviously there's a lot of differences here, but uh, I believe initially when you approached this, it was very much trying to be objective. And I, I imagine that was intentional to an extent. At what point did you kind of cross that boundary, if you will, and really started to not just empathize with people, but just to, uh, I guess, open up your heart to it? The minute you start hearing the stories, 26-year-old woman comes to see me, Mr. Feinberg. I lost my uh, husband at the World Trade Center. He was a fireman. And he left me with our two children, six and four. Now, you're going to give me, award, $2.6 million tax-free. I want it in 30 days. Well, Mrs. Jones, uh, this is public taxpayer money from the U.S. Treasury. It may take a little bit longer than 30 days, maybe 60 or 90 days, but you'll get your money. No, 30 days. And I said to her, Mrs. Jones, why do you need the money in 30 days? Why? I'll tell you why, Mr. Feinberg. I have terminal cancer. I have 10 weeks to live. My husband was going to survive me and take care of our two little ones. Now they are going to be orphans. And I have to set up a trust now and find a guardian while I still have my faculties. I don't have a lot of time. Well, we ran down to the U.S. Treasury. We accelerated the payment. And we, we got a tour. And eight weeks later, she died. Story after story after story like that is why 20 years later, it hasn't left you. And, and I'm curious because obviously this isn't shown as much in the, in the movie and it, your, your family is presented as one that this supports and understands. Was that really what, what that experience was like? Yes. I can honestly say that uh, my family, my friends, very, very supportive, daily reaffirmation of what I'm trying to accomplish. And also the country was very supportive. You know, I thought at the time taxpayer money that there'd be tremendous pushback from the American people, you know, giving away taxpayer dollars just to these certain people. To the contrary, uh, bipartisan, apolitical. I would walk down an airplane uh, hangar or a terminal. People would run up to me, Mr. Feinberg, aren't you the guy doing the not Tremendous what you're doing for the American people and for those victims there but for fortune could have been any of us so um that made it uh, made it easier but it was uh debilitating and still is when you think about it and, and i'm curious because i know you're uh, an adjunct professor at, at many different law schools when you're teaching this stuff what makes for a good mediator like would you recommend someone be as emotionally invested well i'm not sure how much of mediation skill can be taught there's a lot of personality involved in being an effective mediator. I try and explain to students that if, they, if they're interested in mediation, 
get as much clinical and practical experience as they can. If you go to a law firm or you go to a nonprofit or whatever you might do, try and delve, you know, dip into the waters a little bit, see what it's like, and then decide for yourself whether or not it's uh, uh, an area of the law you want to focus on or whether you want a more conventional practice. I am still curious in the sense of like, is does, is it a good thing to be emotionally vested? I, I understand it from the standpoint of you want to be able to you know, bring empathy, which I certainly think is an important aspect of human connection. But does that ever does that ever create a problem or a challenge with with uh, with funds like these? All the time, every time. I don't think anybody who uh, designs and administers these programs can remain totally objective especially if there are family members or victims who want to talk with you about their plight and uh, how, how the disaster has impacted them personally. And I think that anybody who thinks that you can <laughs> administer these programs with the type of objectivity that appears on the written page will find Unless you have a heart of stone, there's going to be an emotional component to all of this. Can't be avoided if you're a human being. And as, as you moved on to other relief initiatives, were there any lessons that you apply that you learned from this, this specific fund? Oh, many. At the outset of the 9-11 fund, nowhere in the statute did it require uh, or invite even voluntarily a hearing with the victims. There was no reference to that. We found in the 9-11 fund in all of these programs how useful it is to give the victim, the claimant, the option voluntarily to come and see the administrator and to vent about life's unfairness. And there are many, many people who are the victims of tragedy who don't want to bear their soul to anybody. They grieve in private. There are also a fair number of people who want the opportunity to vent, to come and see the administrator privately. And I think one of the main reasons the 9-11 fund was as successful as it was, was we built into the program the voluntary opportunity for a private hearing, the right to be heard, tremendous asset in selling the program and convincing people it was on the up and up. And I remember reading about this. I know this was very important about having this opportunity for people to come in and express their anger, speak their minds. What, what happened or what do you think would have happened if you did not provide this outlet? I don't think you would have had as many people willing to participate, especially in a 9-11 fund that was so unique and unprecedented. So you want to give people that opportunity if they want to take it. That was a, a key factor. The other big lesson we learned in 9-11 for all these funds, if you want to quiet down the criticism, get the money out the door as fast as you can. All the words in the world are no substitute for quick, efficient delivery of funds. And as the money goes out, in the hundreds of millions of dollars, the critics quiet down. Mr. Feinberg, you're not being fair because I think I'm entitled to more, excuse me, we've already got out the door in 16 months in BP, six and a half billion dollars. 9-11, $7 billion. Boston Marathon, $61 million. I mean, you can say that, you know, I'm not being fair, but take a look at the balance sheet and how quickly we are getting money into the hands of eligible claimants. Very important. You know, one of the things that I felt was interesting was was your relationship with, with Charles Wolf. When you're doing these funds, have you ever had any other instances where you have these almost like these, these direct adversaries or critics that you have to almost convert, if you will? All the time. Uh, there's a lot of dramatic license taken in the movie about Charles Wolfe and the role that he played, played by Stanley Tucci. But uh, there's no question 
that Charles Wolf and in, in all of these programs, there are always a few gadflies who want the program to work, but feel that it's not, that it's lacking something. And to the extent that they get involved and uh, participate in the process and prod you to make changes, well, that, that's all to the good, I think. Transparency is very, very important in these programs. And I'm curious, just, just from, from the time you got started, even with Agent Orange to today, how are you different? Oh, you become much more. One thing, you become much more fatalistic. I mean, I don't think I plan more than two weeks in advance. You don't know what's, what curveball is going to be thrown at you tomorrow. These innocent victims who are just in the wrong place at the wrong time, fate. Also, I think you become a much better listener. Over the years, I've become much more tuned in to exhibiting empathy through silence. Just listening, you're a sounding board. And I think all of that helps. And just dealing with so much or being around so much loss in, in your business, how do you remain positive? Well, I mean, it, it, you know, <laughs> Uh, let me give you an example. The 9-11 fund, you, I urge people, especially younger people, to see the movie Worth. Because that movie is actually quite uplifting today. It shows the American people today in 2021 how just 20 years ago, not a century ago, just 20 years ago, the country rallied around the victims. It wasn't blue states, red states, liberal, conservative, Republican, Democrat, everybody. Apolitical, bipartisan, let's help. And it helps sort of reinforce your view that it can be like that again. I've learned over the years, never underestimate the charitable impulse of the American people. It's astounding to me astounding. I think it goes back to 17th century Puritan New England, Massachusetts, and, and, and the, the notion of the city on a hill, the community. So despite all the horror and the polarization, I still think that there's a, a window of opportunity, and we can learn from the movie and from the book that uh, there is a better way. And, and speaking about the movie, I, I, I know I mentioned I'd ask this, but what was it like to be played by Michael Keaton? Well, it was surreal. I got to know Michael Keaton pretty well, and we chatted and discussed the fund, some of the issues in the fund. His physical mannerisms and his accent were pretty good. He's, not a, you know, he's from Montana, not Boston, but he did a pretty good job. My kids would say that Michael Keaton's a great actor, Dad, but... Uh, he ought to stick with Batman because uh, he didn't quite catch the essence. But that's family. So you, they're, they're tough critics. You know, it was in, it was surreal. I'll tell you that. While Ken's achieved a great deal of notoriety as an advocate for justice towards victims, he has no plans of riding off into the sunset anytime soon. I wanted to know, after decades of experiencing some of the most difficult and emotionally exhausting work, what keeps him going? I like what I do. It's challenging. It keeps you going. It reinforces the notion that you're still, uh, despite being in your 70s, you're still providing some common benefit to the country. And what's the alternative? I like what I do. And I'm much more discriminating as to the assignments I'll take. But overall, I plan to continue as long as I think I can be productive. And undoubtedly, there's a lot of you know, attorneys that are listening to this podcast, and I imagine some would love to be involved with you know, a, a cause like this or something that's on the national stage. W where do you recommend they, they begin? Well, first of all, in most of these programs, I need support. Don't forget, my law firm is just me. So whenever we have one of these programs, I uh, reach out and uh, retain the services of lawyers, accountants, claims, appraisers, etc. I usually retain the services of former students who um, I'll ask them, did you take my course? What was your grade in mass towards? And that's a beginning. You know, when President Kennedy said that every individual can make a difference, lawyers who are listening to this podcast that want to give back to the country, there are myriad ways that you can provide 
in the public interest. I must say the 9-11 fund, if it hadn't been for the 1,500 lawyers that Leo Boyle in Boston, the head of Atler at the time, this program, if the uh, lawyers hadn't en masse come to the rescue of me and the 9-11 fund pro bono, the fund would have never succeeded the way it did. And uh, I'll always be in the debt of my profession for how lawyers, whatever their walk of life, just dropped what they were doing and helped represent pro bono all these victims in submitting claims to the fund. And that made a huge difference. And throughout this experience, was there ever a time where you considered, you know, how am I going to press on and, and not just you from an emotional standpoint, but more so even from a, uh, a business or financial standpoint, like, or do you just stay focused on what it is that you're doing and, you know, the, the money comes as, you know, as a byproduct? You don't take on these assignments if you're not convinced you'll start and finish them. And there was never a moment in any of these programs, even the BP oil spill fund, where I was so challenged that I thought about, well, maybe I'll pass the baton to somebody else. No way. And, uh, you know, if you don't want to do it, don't do it. Uh, but, but if you're going to take it on, take a deep breath and wade in because it's going to be a challenge and you know it. And is there anything that you're doing on a day-to-day basis, just the, the, you know, any habits that you practice, anything that allows you to, to remain engaged on a day-to-day basis? Well, I've always found a great benefit in the fact that I'm an early riser. I'm at my desk by 7 a.m. And by 9.30 a.m., I've really accomplished a great deal because the phone starts ringing at 9 o'clock. And I think that you develop discipline. Every lawyer is different. But you develop habits of thought, approaches, ways to get your workday most efficient. You develop um, an approach. And everybody's different. But my approach is early rise. Don't take work home at night. What what time do you usually go home at night? Six o'clock. I'm home in my house by 6.30, 6.45. Evening is time to do other things, relax, listen to music, uh, spend time with the grandchildren, your children, et cetera. And it's during the day that I'm focused. And and Ken, as we come to a close, this being the Game Changing Attorney podcast, what does being a game changer mean to you? Well, I've never looked at it that way. I can tell my fellow lawyers a couple of things. One, we're we're part of a very noble profession. Yes, there's all sorts of criticism about lawyers. Really, there's criticism about every profession. And I think in my lifetime, certainly in, in my career, with honor, I reference my legal background, my lawyer skills, and what I've tried to accomplish. And I think lawyers should practice However, they they get fulfilled, fulfillment. Don't be a lawyer or or a member of any profession or any work life that you're not satisfied, that you're not, you don't think you've accomplished personally, personally, what you want to accomplish. I've never looked upon it as much as game changing as I've looked upon it as something where I believe I have personally, looking in the mirror, upon reflection, achieved personally what I wanted to achieve, a fulfilling profession, and I look upon it with satisfaction. That's the test, self-satisfaction, self-evaluation, not what others think. I wanna give a huge thank you to Ken Feinberg for taking the time to speak with us today. You know, what particularly resonated with me was when Ken said that the biggest mistakes he made when speaking with victims were ones based on emotional assumptions. And only by opening our hearts and listening to other stories are we able to truly understand and represent them to the best of our ability. You've been listening to the Game Changing Attorney Podcast with me, Michael Mogul. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate it if you can leave a review and share this podcast with at least one other ambitious law firm owner. And you know what? Maybe more than one. For more information on our interview with Ken Feinberg, see the show notes for this episode in your podcast app or visit GameChangingAttorney.com. 
And join us next time and we'll be speaking with social psychologist, professor of organizational behavior at Cornell University, and the best-selling author of You Have More Influence Than You Think, Dr. Vanessa Bonds. It's embarrassment that keeps people from acting in those situations. It's sort of the social risk. There's also sometimes a physical risk in these situations, but a lot of it is the social risk that if everyone's sitting around acting normal and I'm the one who gets up and says like, oh my God, there's a fire. And then it was actually, there wasn't really a problem. It's gonna be so embarrassing. And so we don't act out of a fear of embarrassment. That's next time on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. Oh,